Let's look at the Word of God. And we're going to be looking uh, in the Old Testament today, in the book of Genesis. So right at the beginning, let's look at Genesis chapter 18. It's like basically saying, hey, I'm going to 
cook you a nice steak, you know, this, this kind of, of level of things, you know, is, is what he is doing. He, he, and it's very expensive too, right? And so this is, you know, back then, you know, raising in, and all of the stuff, it was very, you know, very expensive things. And so he selects the choices and brings back the best for these three strangers, right, that come to him. So, you know, think about that. Can you really just imagine that? Imagine you're just sitting around one afternoon, you know, flipping the remote, watching TV, or doing, you know, looking at the computer, or, you know, whatever you're doing, right? And then, you know, someone comes knocking on the door, you know, three strangers, and then you just, like, welcome them. You, you know, give them food, water, you know, wash up. You know, I'm going to give you some nice robes to wear in our house. This, my house is your house. And, you know, you, you bring out some your nicest food, you know, for them. You know, all kinds of things you're, you do for these three strangers. Yet, you know, that's exactly what Abraham did. So let's look at Romans chapter 12. We'll look at Romans chapter 12. And in verse 13. Romans chapter 12. Share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Mm -hmm. right? So it says, practice hospitality, right? We should share it, right? What we do have, if there's a brother and sister that is having a, a, you know, that, you know, we should practice hospitality. You know, this is something, you know, even for myself, uh, I tend to have a hard time with, like, being, like, just so generous to someone. I usually tend to, like, calculate, like, is it useful? Like, if I give something, is it, like, useful, right, to give them something? And so we tend to calculate like that in the world, right? We're very legalistic. If I give to you, are you going to give back? And we tend to be not generous, but calculative in all things. Um, also, if you look at Romans 12 in verse 20, if you skip down, Romans chapter 12, verse 20. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. So it's not just to brothers and sisters, but even if there is an enemy, right? Even if there's an enemy, that, you know, it's, it's hard enough actually showing hospitality, even if your friend comes over, but even the enemies, you should be generous and you should. Uh, if he's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, and give him something to drink. You know, something like this. It's like keeping burning coals on him. Right? So let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse 2. Right? So this was his 
uh, the Lord's appearance here on earth. So, of course, when the Lord came, this is the, he is the fullness of God. But, you know, God appeared also in parts uh, as, a, in, you know, pre-Jesus Christ. So he, this is the pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ, truth, essentially, revealing itself to people, right? And so there were various instances like this in the Old Testament. Um, Abraham, uh, Moses also had a burning push, uh, bush that, uh, where the Lord appeared to him. And so the thing about this is, is it's not as if they were um, any special people or anything like that. It's not like we, we look at Abraham, we look at, um, we, we look at Abraham, we look at Moses, or we look at any of them. So they were in tune to God's presence, and um, we really must uh, learn from these fathers of faith very well. So um, in our life, um, you know, God, he revealed himself, and in our life, don't we also wish to reveal God's presence also? Perhaps uh, last year, uh, we were in a barren situation, just like Abraham and Sarah were. Um, it wasn't a fruitful kind of year for us. Um, but uh, I do hope that this year uh, we can desire for a new great hope in God and have love and faith towards God and others and be in tune to Him. Right? So uh, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 18 and let's go on. And then verse 9 through 11. Genesis chapter 18, and verse 9 through 11, it says, uh, Where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old, well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of child. So, uh, what do these strangers and what do these angels uh, say to uh, Abraham? They said that this old barren Sarah, in one year, she is going to have a son. Right? And so, um, you know, there's a context that we have to really know about this. Uh, back then, children were a very, very great blessing back then. Right? It was a really, really amazing blessing to um, that, you know, that this was the sign, really, that of uh, fruitfulness back then. And so to be barren and that you have no heir was essentially like a horrific fate, right? It's not like, you know, now where, uh, you know, of course, there's people that uh, also don't have children, but back then, for them, their context was that if you didn't have a child, essentially, that this was like a horrific fate of death. It was essentially life being cut off. That's how horrific the context of that situation was back then. And so, you know, Abraham, he had been living his life in this sort of horrible kind of fate with life cut off. Abraham was already 100 years old, Sarah was 90, it was impossible to have a child. No one would even consider this um, a possibility to uh, back then. Uh, but God, through these angels, speak to Abraham about this kind of possibility. Right? He uh, spoke to Abraham about this possibility that they otherwise thought would be impossible. Right? A possibility that they thought would be impossible. In other words, it is the impossible possibility. Right? You know, something like this. I'm giving you this term right now. It is the impossible possibility. I hope we can really remember that phrase well today. Because that's how great God is. God is the creator of the impossible. God is the one that can make the impossible possible. He creates the impossible possibility in our lives. And so, you know, when you actually think about it, you know, the mere fact of our existence, the fact that we even live now in this universe and all this universe and us exist, that in and of itself is already an impossible possibility. I mean, the truth is that our existence came from nothing. I mean, there was God, but he created from nothing. 
I like this quote from uh, Pastor S. M. Lockridge, and he speaks about how great God is, and he uses Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where God says, where the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and this is his quote, right? So he says, Genesis 1, verse 1 says, in the beginning God. So where did God come from? He came from nowhere, because there wasn't anywhere for him to come from. And coming from nowhere, he stood on nothing. And the reason he had to stand on nothing, there was nowhere for him to stand. And standing on nothing, he reached out to where there was nowhere to reach, and he caught something. When there was nothing to catch, and hung something on nothing, and told it to stay there. Standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will, and he struck the anvil of his omnipotence, and sparks flew. He caught them on the tips of his fingers, and flung them out into space, and beckoned the heavens with stars. And nobody said a word. The reason nobody said anything, there wasn't anybody there to say anything, so God himself said, that's God. Right? So this is his uh, quote on Genesis 1 verse 1. So what is he trying to say? He's just basically saying, like, when you think about God, like God creating this universe and this earth and all of us, right? I mean, essentially, there was nothing there. Right? And so even if he created, there, was no, there wasn't anybody there to say anything that it was good. So God himself says it's good. And so, you know, this is what the point he is trying to make is, is that, you know, that is how great God is. From nothing, he created all of this. So, you know, he made the possible from the impossible. Right? And also, where was the revelation of the impossible possibility? Uh, this was in Jesus Christ. It was in the Lord Jesus Christ who overcame the impossible fate of death, right? And so we really see that, right? And so um, in Abraham, we see that he received a Christophany, a revelation of overcoming this impossibility of death. For him, being, not having a child, back then in that cultural context especially, this was like life being cut off. It was essentially death in that culture and in that society. And so he receives this revelation that, hey, we can overcome this situation of death. And so, you know, really we see that in the situation of Abraham, and then we really see it come to fruition, obviously, in its fullness, when Jesus Christ indeed dies on the cross and overcomes the impossible. Right? And so he overcomes the impossible with the resurrection. Right? And so, you know, how great of a blessing is that, that, you know, for us, you know, for Abraham, you know, he, he had to believe in this situation when, you know, it seemed like life and death was cut off, but he just had faith. For us, you know, it, is even in, even in, it isn't even in that this difficult situation. All we have to do is just accept Jesus Christ by faith. Right? That's it, you know, right? just accept Jesus by faith, and that's all. And so, you know, like Abraham, you know, the truth is, is that we're just, you know, regular people, right? Abraham is just a regular guy, you know, all of us are just regular people, but what happens is, is that the Holy Spirit speaks to us, and he reveals things to us by faith. And so, uh, you know, he gave us Jesus Christ, he gave us the Holy Spirit, so that we can receive the true, righteous, and good possibilities that are out there. What I think is impossible, he opens up a whole new world of possibility, just like he did through Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. He, when we receive Jesus by faith, he continues to do things like that for us too. We receive true, righteous, and good possibilities that we think are out there, not only for our lives, but for this, the salvation of this entire world as well too. And so that comes to us, right? The Holy Spirit speaks to us and says, hey, what are those impossible possibilities, right? And so, you know, Christophany, you know, what was that? I said that was like pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. This was before Jesus came. But, you know, of course, we're after Jesus, right? Jesus already came. So we're accepting Jesus by faith. And, you know, when Jesus comes to us, what also comes to us is the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit of Christ. And so what does the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ 
you know, give to us when it speaks about this true, righteous, and good, impossible possibilities of God, more than a Christophany, I have another term for you, and that is an epiphany. So you've probably heard of this term too. It's an epiphany, right? And so the Holy Spirit, it speaks to us like that. It thinks, oh, you know, God is giving me an epiphany from, like, divine, you know, revelation. You know, there is this goal, there is this impossible possibility for me, too. And so, you know, here's the thing. You know, most people, you've probably heard of the term epiphany, right? And so it's like some, some striking idea, some beyond idea, never even thought of before. So most people, when they think of an epiphany, they think of it mostly from, like, within like suddenly some idea in my mind is like forming from my brain or something like that. Um, and, but you know what often happens with you know, ideas from our own mind and our own brain like that? Um, very often, or great ideas that we often have just flounder because of our own weaknesses and sin, right? And so we have a great idea, and so we should go off and do something, but you know, that great idea flounders under our own weaknesses or limitations and and so, you know, I can say that from experience. I can't tell you how many failed ideas I've had. I've had all kinds of ideas in my life about, you know, this and about that. And, you know, floundering, right? And that's what happens. And so, you know, for humans, when it comes to epiphanies, yeah, we can have epiphanies coming from ourselves. But, you know, we often do see how much they uh, flounder, right? They flounder and they fail in their own limitations. And so rather, what is it that we need when it comes to an epiphany, this impossible possibility? We need God's power. Right? We need it from above. More than from within, we really need to seek from God and seek from above. He is the vine and we are the branches. We receive from Him by faith. And so, with God, with God, the impossible possibility remains since we believe in the higher and greater power. So let's continue on. Let's look at Genesis uh, chapter 18 and in verse 12 through 15. Uh, Genesis 18 and in verse 12 through 18. So Sarah laughed to herself and she thought, After I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child? Now that I am old, and now that I am old, it is anything too hard for the Lord. I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, and so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. So uh, the promise of God was delivered to uh, Abraham through these strangers, right? Through these angels. Uh, but, you know, Sarah, how was it that uh, she laughed? <laughs> she laughed. And so, you know, what kind of laugh is this? It's probably a little bit like a <laughs> like chuckling to herself, you know, not, not thinking anyone was going to hear about, you know, hear her laugh, right? And so she's like chuckling to herself, and like, but you know, Sarah, God kind of knows this unbelief of Sarah, right? Of course, God knows everything, and so God knows the unbelief of Sarah, and she, he knows what's in Sarah's heart when he laughs, and so he rebukes her, and he says, Sarah, you've been laughing like this as anything too hard for the Lord. And so, you know, Sarah is a bit afraid about the situation, and so she lies, right? She lies, she says, oh, I didn't laugh, even though she really did chuckle, but she, she, she lies and she says, she didn't laugh. Actually, you know, here's the thing, um, Abraham also laughed, right? And so this was a chapter earlier, and so uh, let's look at Genesis 17. So actually, God already had given Abraham this hope. He didn't just say clearly when. It was only through the strangers that said clearly when in one year you will have a son. But um, the promise of God was given to Abraham earlier. So let's look at Genesis 17 and in verse 16 and 17. It says, I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. King of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ten? And so here, um, Abraham also laughed, right? He laughed and he fell face down, you know, like this. And then some people wonder, like, what's the difference then? I mean, Sarah laughed, right? And then she was, you know, rebuked by the Lord saying, hey, you know, you did laugh. And, 
you know, she ends up to get into this like unfortunate situation where she's lying to God and, and all that kind of stuff. But here, Abraham also laughs, but you know, <laughs> he's not rebuked by the Lord. And so, you know, what was the difference? And so, uh, you know, the, the commentator Matthew Henry explained it. He says, hey, you know, the Lord is more than just about the laughing outwardly, but you know, the Lord knows the heart, right? And so he's saying one springs from unbelief, and that is Sarah, and the other is springing from faith. And so Abraham had faith. And so, you know, one is like, okay, so let's take this situation, right? And so someone gives you like a really big hopeful dream for God's kingdom, something big in your life and big for God's kingdom, saying, you know, really God is going to allow you to do this amazing thing in your life for God's glory and for God's kingdom. And then, you know, how do people respond? So some people say, hey, amen, you know, like I'm going to go do it, I'm going to go do it. And then another person also says amen, but then they say, Amen. <laughs> you know, kind of like that. Like a, a little bit of a question mark, right? And so, you know, the two words are exactly the same, but, you know, one has doubt and one has faith towards it, right? And so, you know, that's what we're talking about here. That's the difference between the two, right? And so, you know, this seems very, it's something impossible that happened to bring life forward from a completely dead, barren situation. It was dead, barren situation. She could not have a child, yet God sprang forth life from that situation. It's because God can do it. God is the one that can do it. God can raise Jesus. He rose Jesus from the dead. That means that there is nothing too hard for the Lord. And so that's why we always have to have faith, joy, and hope in God. And so, you know, we can see that Abraham laughs, you know, as he's laughing, it's like a very joyful, you know, it's a joyful laugh. You know, that's how it should be. It shouldn't just be sort of like a, a chuckle, perhaps a bit of doubt, like, oh, it'd be nice if that happened, but, you know, a little bit of doubt. And no, it should be, a very, should, you know, our laugh before God should have faithful joy and hope in it. Now, to be clear, I do want to speak about Sarah and, you know, also uh, clarify everything about her. So, actually, when you look in Genesis 21, so a few chapters down, Genesis 21, and then verse 6 and 7, right? And so this is when actually Isaac is born, right? This is when Isaac is born. And here's the thing about Isaac. The name Isaac, that's self, right? this name, we have a person named Isaac in our church. So the name Isaac itself, is, it means to laugh, right? Is what it really means. He means, it means he laughs, right? That's, how, that's, what, that's what the name Isaac means. And so, uh, let's look at verse 6 and 7 in Genesis 21, verse 6 and 7. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said, Abraham, that Sarah would have a nurse and children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Right? And so, um, you know, she, you know, she, you know, from this doubt that she has before, you know, we definitely see repentance in Sarah. And then now, you know, she does have a son, and she's not only saying, hey, I'm full of joy at this grace of God, uh, but others are laughing together with me. Her laughter, her laughter of joy overflows to others. And then uh, Hebrews makes it very, very clear. So this is also in Hebrews. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. And in verse 11, so we can see more about the faith of Sarah, Hebrews 11, and verse 11. <clears throat> it says, And by faith, Abraham, even though he was past childbirth, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become, um, was, was able to become, uh, sorry, I can't, able to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made a promise. Right? And so, you know, here, uh, you know, it speaks about Abraham and Sarah there, and it's speaking about the people of faith, right? And so, really, um, you know, both Abraham and Sarah, uh, they come, they, Abraham has faith, Sarah repents and comes to have faith too, and shouldn't we have this faith as well too? Faith, joy, and hope that God is the one who does all things, he does things that are beyond our ability, and we should really look up to God. Right? God is the one that can do amazing things beyond anything that we can think of. 
And so, you know, really I'm thinking about God, you know, what is it that God will do in me this year? Like, what are the amazing things that God will do for us in this year? Um, you know, I really think, you know, even here living in Silicon Valley, you know, this is something we should think about too. This is something we're actually we're perfectly familiar with. You know, in the tech Silicon Valley, one thing that they, they talk about is uh, scalability, right? And so, you know, uh, you know, Air, like, you know that, big, that company, Airbnb, this is how we get our houses for the, when we get a retreat center, right? And so Airbnb, you know how it started? It started basically with a, a few guys in an apartment and uh, they rented out mattresses in their apartment so that people visiting the city uh, that they could you know rent out their a mattress you know for people to sleep on when they come and visit it right and so they thought well hey if we can do this then we can make a whole website and other people can do this as well too and so they just took this really small idea of someone coming and visit and sleeping on a mattress and they turned it into something bigger and so they called it a uh, you know, they, they made it bigger, right? And so in Silicon Valley, we talk about this. We used to call it scalability, making it bigger like that, right? And so for them, they had this scalable epiphany, right? Well, what can we do it bigger? And so for us, too, I think that that must come to us as well, too. Well, you know, all the things that we're doing, how God is blessing him, how I'm living my life, to have this scalable epiphany as well, too, that God can do it, God will make something bigger, that there is no limit. Right? In God, in His kingdom, there is no limit of something small scaling all the way up to God. There is nothing too difficult for Him. And so, you know, as we pray for these scalable epiphanies in our life, we must consider these impossible possibilities that God has for us that is beyond us. It's because God has the power. Even though we don't have the power, God has the power to make the impossible possible. You know, there's a story of a little boy small little boy, uh, barely, you know, barely can walk, and he was, uh, you know, brought to a sandcastle area, right? So he was, uh, you know, in a sandbox in his, in his backyard, right? And so uh, he was building sandcastles, but inside of the sandbox, there was a, a, a rock, you know, as he was like building his sandcastles, there was a, a rock a little bit too big in the sand. And so, you know, he took and he tried to push that rock, and he was able to push it with his feet and with his hands and nudge it to the edge of the sandbox. But, you know, there was the wall to the sandbox, and so, you know, he really, he was trying to get that, that rock, like, over, over that wall, right? So he grunted, he struggled, he pushed, but, you know, what happened was that the rock just, like, fell down and, and smashed his, his fingers like this, right? And so, oh, the boy, he's like, you know, he's small, so he's like, really, he's crying. And so his father was, you know, in the house, watching from the house, and, uh, you know, seeing, you know, seeing all that happen. And then, so he runs up to the boy, and he says to the son, who was trying to lift this rock, you know, over the, the, the wall of the sandcastle, he says, hey, son, you know, why didn't you use all the strength you had, right? And then, so he says, you know, Daddy, you know, I did do that. I used all the strength I had to, you know, he pushed, he grunted to try to get that rock, you know, over the wall. And so, you know, he did it. I, I used all the strength I had to do it. And he says, no, son, you didn't use all of it. You didn't ask me for help, you know, to get it over. Right? And so, you know, it's true. You know, that's how often we are. We just look to ourselves and we push and we grunt and we do things on our own, you know, like that. You know, we should really look towards God. He's the one that gives us this great dream. Uh, he allows us that, that, you know, scalable big goal that we should have in our life. And, you know, we shouldn't do that, you know, forgetting about the strongest power that we have. And that strongest power we have is, of course, from God. Right? That's the power of God where no task is too difficult for Him. God is the one that makes the impossible possible. And so uh, Abraham would come to see he had this deep, faithful joy, uh, hope, and loving relationship with God, and God did things beyond his thoughts. And so rather than relying on ourselves and hoping on our own, I hope that we can have faith and accept God's great dream can be fulfilled in us. Our dreams are small, but God's dreams are the kingdom. So in our relationship with God, uh, let's put our hope in God. God gives us the impossible possibilities. And so I hope that in our hearts, um, we can have a faithful uh, amen and pray with this hope. And um, in this faithful uh, path of God's kingdom, God is the one who's going to make the impossible possible with his power and his will. Okay.
Uh, Father God, we thank you, Lord. Uh, we thank you that, um, Lord, um, in unexpected ways, uh, you uh, come to us and uh, you also give us a great hope that we cannot imagine in our life. Uh, to really dream of the impossible possibility of your righteous kingdom, Lord, and how we can have an imp in the impossible possible dream of really uh, being a part of that kingdom and fulfilling and bearing great fruits uh, for you, Lord. And so, Lord, we really seek your will, what you have uh, to do uh, for us in our own life. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for all that you are, all that you give us, uh, Lord, uh, that you are with us in this way, Lord. And so, Lord, uh, may we rely on you, not on our own power, but on your power. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for all that you give us. And in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.